the homeless crisis in America is worsening again. The COVID pandemic caused a surge in housing costs and a rise in unemployment, leaving nearly 600,000 Americans unhoused in 2020. We have to shut down a piece of our own humanity to be able to walk past another human being that is in such difficult situation. And being homeless, your, your days and were spent from where I'm going to lay my head at tonight, where I'm going to get my next bite of food from. And what people don't typically realize when they walk past a person who's homeless is that this person is costing taxpayers a lot of money. Cities across America are spending more than ever to combat the crisis. In 2019, New York spent a record-breaking $3 billion to support its homeless population. California is also expected to break its record, allocating $4.8 billion of its budget to the same issue over the next two years. And areas like that just don't seem to be getting any better, despite the fact that every politician claims that this is a top priority of theirs and the budgets keep going up. Overall, homelessness in America has only improved 10% compared to 2007. It's even worse for certain subgroups, such as individual homelessness, which dropped only a percent in the same period. On the contrary, 2020 saw a 30% increase in the unsheltered homeless, erasing over half a decade of work since its dramatic rise in 2015. Right now, we are trending in the wrong direction. Uh, so the state of homelessness right now is, is pretty tenuous, uh, and there are some small increases that are taking place uh, across the board. So how is the U.S. addressing the homeless crisis? And can it ever be solved? Homelessness is known to prey on some of the most vulnerable populations in America. In 2020, 20% of those who were unhoused suffered from severe mental disorders, while 16% suffered from chronic substance abuse. In response, the U.S. has long relied on a housing-ready approach to homelessness where those who are unhoused had to meet specific requirements such as sobriety or completion of treatment in order to qualify for a home. That was until this man, Dr. Sam Simbaris, pioneered the Housing First initiative. At some point, myself and the people we were working with realized that really insisting that people change, get sober, take medication, get your life together in order to earn or be uh, awarded housing was not working. It just, you know, people couldn't. People were on the street. They couldn't stay sober. They couldn't. They were not interested in, in medication. They were interested in being somewhere safe and secure. The Housing First initiative follows two tenets. First, the most effective solution to homelessness is permanent housing. And second, all housing for the homeless should be provided immediately without any preconditions. Putting people in housing first, which is what they were desperate to do, calms that survival thing, and people are safe, secure, and then they're saying to us, I need more help here, you know? So then rather than having it us pushing or coer coercing people to get to treatment, people get housing and then they want treatment. Under the George W. Bush administration, the Housing First initiative gained the spotlight as the key to ending homelessness. Related programs soon received billions of dollars in support from government agencies, such as the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness and the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Housing First's rise really begins in the 90s, especially the, in the late 90s. And I think it really gained traction as the philosophy that should dominate those dedicated homeless services agencies and programs. And so we are, we're in a situation now where you meet people who work at HUD on homelessness or in major agencies in California and New York, it's relatively rare to not find them be committed to housing first. If you really look at it this year, um, it will give, the federal government will give about 2.7 billion uh, to housing and service providers and housing and, and, and cities across the, across the country. For decades, the Housing First policy has successfully housed individuals that need it the most. Shannon McGee is one of them. A nonprofit organization, Pathways to Housing, helped Shannon move into his support of housing in 2020 after staying unhoused for four years. It started in 2008, um, losing my mom to lung cancer. 
and then not having a strong support system to support me throughout the process. I ended up losing the family house. They sold the family house and didn't have anywhere to go. And that started the, the, the stint of being homeless. From being housed to now being unhoused, the shelter for me was very hard to, it was a culture shock. It was very hard to adjust to the, the environment, the living standards. I finally got connected to the Veteran Affairs and a social worker with them connected me to Pathways. Um, and since being connected to Pathways, everything has turned around 360 degrees. I'm, I'm housed. I'm gainfully, I'm looking for gainful employment. I'm in school now, so that, and not without having pathways there to kind of be that support and that coach to guide me into housing, I wouldn't be where I'm at now. A study in 2004 discovered that when individuals were provided with stable, affordable housing with services under their control, 79% remained stably housed at the end of six months. Another study in 2000 found it to be more effective than traditional programs. 88% of the participants in Housing First programs remain housed compared to just 47% in the city's residential treatment program. And it's not just in the United States. A similar study conducted in Canada revealed similar results, showing participants of Housing First programs obtaining and retaining housing at a much higher rate. The evidence has shown that by getting people housed uh, immediately, uh, and eliminating the chaos of homelessness created a space where people would be more successful. I don't have to be in that environment anymore where I'm subjected to using drugs or to doing things for money that I didn't want to do. Um, I can change my, my, my focus is now I can say, hey, you're housed. How can we get you to your next level of finding gainful employment? What, what steps can we work on now? Housing First not only supports those in need with housing, but the assistance they need to get back on their feet again. It's Housing First, not housing only, because there are very rich services, like there's a team of people, really, whether they're social workers or social workers and nurses and psychiatrists, people with lived experience. It's like a support services team. And then the team says to you, how can I help you? They provide wraparound support for me. So um, if I need assistance in getting things such as my ID or a birth certificate, they help with that. They support me through that process. If I need to make appointments at the VA hospital, they support me through that process. What any and everything that I pretty much need done, I have support through Pathways to Housing. Supporters of Housing First also argue that it's cost efficient. A comprehensive study in 2015 concluded that shelter and emergency department costs decreased with Housing First policies. What people don't typically realize when they walk past a person who's homeless is that this person is costing taxpayers a lot of money. People get very sick when they're homeless. They have to be taken to the hospital. Sometimes they, they steal food. They have no money. They get arrested. Court costs, police time, jail time. When you tally up the annual costs of people who are homeless and very vulnerable, it turns out we're actually spending sometimes $50,000 a year or $100,000 a year in some cases, and, and the person is still homeless. But perhaps the biggest advantage to Housing First is the improvement in the quality of life it provides. Being homeless and being a parent, I kind of didn't want my child to see me in, the situ in that situation. So it made, it kind of put a wedge in our relationship for a little bit. But once I got housed now, I could provide a space where we can interact together and she wouldn't have to be subjected to that, that, that lifestyle. Being able to have my housing first, I know that I'm in control of my environment now. What happens here is all about what I, I, I create. But housing first also comes with its own set of criticisms. Experts like Stephen Ide from the Manhattan Institute believe that Housing First hasn't shown any real result. When the public is told that this particular policy is going to end homelessness, what they're expecting is that they're going to see fewer homeless people around, that homelessness numbers will significantly drop as a result of the implementation of this policy. And I don't think that we've seen that in the case of Housing First. Critics also point out that Housing First might not be as cost-effective as it looks. Research in 2015 discovered that while permanent housing intervention was more successful in achieving housing stability, it was also more expensive than temporary housing. A 2018 survey by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine 
also concluded that there is no published evidence to prove that permanent supportive housing improves health outcomes or reduces health care costs. No government that I'm aware of has saved money by investing in homeless services through a housing first approach. You can talk about potential cost offsets, that is if you invest a million dollars in housing first, that will trim some of the budgets and some other service systems. You're not going to actually save money, reduce the cost of government to the point where you could be talking about, let's say, a tax reduction as a result of investing in housing first. So I think that there, was, there has been some misleading of the public with respect to that concern. There is also the question of whether the need for housing actually triumphs over the need for treatment. If we want more from people, we have to be talking about um, far more than just housing. But in the housing first era, there's a way in which housing just continues to suck all the air out of the room. And all we keep coming back to is, are we doing enough to expand the stock of subsidized housing to help the homeless? Meanwhile, Dr. Simbaris argues that the criticisms towards Housing First are designed to blame those who are unhoused, rather than to assist them. They want to go back to treatment and sobriety first, you know, and then housing maybe, because that changes the entire narrative back to homelessness is the fault of the individual. You know, anybody who fails in a capitalist society like ours, you know, with no, you know, taxation and no government, is only because it's their fault. Housing First hit its first bump under the Trump administration that sought to replace it with programs focused more on treatment and sobriety. They were talking about housing fourth as a policy, housing fourth, okay? And that was very deliberate because it's housing first. And they were like, no, housing fourth, you know, treatment, sobriety, employment, and housing maybe. You know, that's, it was a very, very a targeted attack. The Biden administration, however, showed a return to housing first. The American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 included 70,000 emergency housing vouchers and a staggering $350 billion in state and local fiscal recovery funds in an effort to aid homelessness and housing instability. The Biden administration absolutely supports a housing first approach. They feel that in, 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 a, in a society as ours, that housing should be a right and not a privilege that every American deserves a safe and stable place to call home. So they are, you know, providing the, the, the resources and, and the support. Critics of Housing First believe that lawmakers need to be giving more alternative policies a chance and approach the homeless crisis in a more structured manner. We need to have them invest in a broad range of programs, residential programs, that can benefit the homeless population in all its variety because the homeless population is very diverse. Within that framework, Housing First like programs would have a place, low barrier programs would have a place, but they would not rule the roost in the way that they currently do. Those in support of Housing First believe that more resources and support from the government are needed to truly end the crisis once and for all. Well, if you don't have the resources in the program to deliver a place to live, then your listening and your promise to them is hollow. You need to have the listening, let's call that the policy, which is, you know, housing first, you know, person first. But then you need the resources behind the policy, apartments, subsidy, support services, in order to actually make the package viable. You know, we're nowhere near where we need to be in investment, uh, either of building uh, public housing or affordable housing, uh, having, you know, the, the capacity to address the homeless, homeless problem, we're, we're nowhere near. What's important is that homelessness is a crisis that can be solved as long as there is enough attention, care, and resources to support the cause. It's just very disgraceful that in a country that's um, so blessed, so wealthy that has done some things right in the past, if not everything, um, that we can't do something um, to, to fix this problem or at least get it, make it smaller, um, ameliorate it. So there's a lot of good work going on. So that's what gives me hope, that we can actually turn the nighttime stars into a daytime 
where we just turn up the lights enough to really end it for all. Because the other thing that gives me hope is we know how to do it. We have the cure. We have good examples of how it's done. We need to take it to scale.